can say is for those of you who were here at 9 o'clock, all of the seminars in support are at 12 o'clock or 10 past 12. So we move a little later. We can't get the room any, we can't get the room at 12 o'clock in the other two quarters, but we can in this quarter. So you don't have to get out of your bed for 9 o'clock in the morning for the seminars. Okay? That's the first thing. Second thing is that um, at a meeting that Deborah and I were both at, um, she suggested that it would be a good idea to have some seminars, this is something that happened in the past, where um, they weren't focused on science directly, but on the sorts of things that you can do with a PhD as how you can become an overworked, underpaid university professor. Faculty member full time, and Deborah um, represents a slightly different career choice with an easier into it. So we've arranged for three of the speakers this quarter to talk about career options, things you can do with a PhD or a graduate degree in plant pathology, apart from becoming full-time research teaching faculty and professor. Okay? And because Deborah said it was a good idea, I immediately asked her to do the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Which made me regret a thought of it at all. So, some of you may not have met Deborah before because she directs the Foundation Plant Services Unit, which is out to the west of the campus. So, a little bit of background. She, Deborah is a faculty member in the department, but she also runs the NPS unit. She's a native of Southern California, and she did all of her uh, graduate undergraduate um, education at UC Riverside, but then at some point in the not too distant past saw the light and moved north, moved north to Davis and has never been ready. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh. It was fun putting this together and I, I used the opportunity to get in touch with people by email and Facebook that I hadn't talked to in years in graduate school, so that was kind of entertaining too. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the more, more interesting lessons I had as a graduate student, as a young scientist, and then a little bit about what I like best about my career and the kinds of things I like doing. So um, feel free to ask questions and bits, and I think I'm having lunch after this seminar with the students, and so we'll have a chance to talk to them as well. Some of you have been out to Foundation Plant Services. It, this is the, the building out there, purple and pink. It's faded a bit since this picture was taken, but um, it is a, a Standalone facility with its own mission in the College of Agriculture. We'll talk more about FPS in a few minutes. But first, let's talk a little bit historically. This was my graduate school class at UC Riverside. Now, I did what they tell you never to do. I did my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD, all at one institution. On the other hand, um, I had a young family and grandma lived in town, so I hardly recommend doing that under those kinds of circumstances because it made it possible for me to take care of my family obligations as well as um, to get through graduate school. Let's see. That's me, right there. <laughs> and this is my graduate school class. Riverside had the other really large plant pathology department in California um, by the time I was in graduate school, which was in the 1980s, uh, Berkeley had already begun to fade out in terms of the number of applied plant pathologists they had. And I think you all know they disbanded their plant pathology department sometime in the mid-1990s. So just to talk a little bit about some of the folks in this slide, um, this is George Levitt. He was a UC Farm Advisor. He had applied to graduate school at Davis, didn't get in. He applied to Riverside, finished his PhD. His salary went up immediately, and he went through the rest of his career having earned that PhD. So George is a good example of don't give up. You don't get what you want right at first. Joe and Paula here got married and moved down back to the bayou in the south, where they now teach school and work as horticulturalists, and never had research careers after they finished their PhDs. Mike Milano here. And Val Milano here met in graduate school, married, moved down to San Diego where Mike runs Milano and Company, which is a floriculture company. He, like his uncle, had both done PhDs in plant pathology before they went back to the family company. And they brought with that a great depth of knowledge of biology, but also really the ties with the university, which they still maintain. This is Weechai Kostornostan. Doing an injustice to his name, he came to us as a young faculty member from Thailand and went back to Thailand as a very well respected senior faculty member there. 
Carol Bender went on to be a professor at OSU, and I will say, you do stay in better touch with your colleagues that stay in the field. The ones that go into other fields don't show up at the American Fire Pass Society meetings every year. We can kind of get out of touch. Um, a few others, Gary Bender became a farm advisor. Val married Mike, had five children, and became a farm advisor in San Diego, where she works on environmental issues, not on anthropology issues, because that was the kind of position that was available. Dave Moore got a postdoc at UC Berkeley as a molecular biologist. He was involved in cloning TMB, the first cloning project of a whole plant virus like that. And um, he worked as a postdoc at Berkeley and still in the Bay Area working for biotech companies. So a lot of different things can happen to people. Sally Schneider probably went the furthest of all of us. Sally was an ARS scientist. She got hired by ARS in the South moved to Fresno for nearly 20 years. She's a nematologist. And she just went to Washington, D.C. about five years ago. And she's now a national program staff person for the Department of Agriculture in California, I mean, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And she's very influential in setting policy across the country in agriculture. So I have a couple of quotes I want to share with you today of things that people have said to me over the years that kind of stuck with me. First, I'm going to quote uh, Professor Alan Dodds, who's an emeritus faculty member from the UC Riverside uh, Department. He said, one time we were talking about career choices, he said, if one out of every 10 PhD students in the UC plant pathology professor's um, uh, labs ended up in an academic position, there would be a serious oversupply. So, so many of you who get your PhDs in our program will be, end up doing something else. And I think it's really helpful for you to know what the something else's are, because some of them are very good and very interesting careers. Now, Bill Dawson, who some of you know, was a faculty member at UC Riverside when I was there. He was one of my favorite professors. He, he had a good sense of wit. <clears throat> he pretty much said that anything you can fix with W40 <laughs> and W40 uh, wasn't worth fixing. And he's the guy who's famous for taking a Mercedes and when the air conditioner broke, dropped, dumping in an air conditioner from a Chevy and somehow it didn't work. <laughs> so Bill said, I think that every faculty member should sit down with a new graduate student and tell them, if you are in this for the money, you aren't smart enough to make it. Go home and think about that for a night and let me know tomorrow if you want to be in my lab or not. <laughs> When I was in graduate school, I had gotten a job after I finished my bachelor's full time working as a technician for the USDA's Agricultural Research Service. And for those of you who might not be familiar with ARS, it's the in house research arm of the USDA. And we have a number of great ARS scientists here in the department. I think one of them, Kendra, is going to be talking to you later in the quarter about a career with ARS. I started out and actually had 14 years into the ARS retirement system. So I worked as a technician, and I had, a, uh, uh, had supervisors and an area office that was sympathetic to the idea of my doing my thesis work on uh, a topic that was also some of the research that we were doing in the lab. And so as I was able to go to school for both my master's and PhD, at least partially supported by ARS, and when I finished my master's, and then PhD, I was promoted into the scientist series um, from the technician series. Just about the time I finished my PhD, which was 1987, the lab I worked for was closed due to a reorganization. And six scientists, were, including me, were working in the department at that time. It was a vector plant pathology lab, so it was entomologists and plant pathologists working on insect vector diseases, area by mite transmitted. Um, viruses in, in peach, um, aphid transmitted viruses in vegetable crops and grains. And in my case, I worked with some of the fastidious prokaryotes, the spiroplasmas, and the phytoplasmas. When the lab was closed, I thought that was very sad, but at the same time, of all the scientists, I thought by far the best transfer of any of them. I was asked to come up to UC Davis and be an ARS member of the department and work on grapevine virus and virus-like diseases. Now, Dr. Austin Goheen, who some of you may have heard of, was the <coughs> ARS virologist for many years here. 
And when he retired, a big hole was left, which we'll talk about more in a minute. But Austin was not going to be replaced. He was replaced because our grape and wine industry, which can be very convincing, went to the ARS administrators and said, we've got to replace this guy. We really need him. And my area director knew he needed a place for me to go. And to, for me, I was always a, a Southern California kid that wanted to live in Northern California. And um, Davis, of course, is the center of plant pathology in the world. So I was really thrilled with this transfer. I came up and interviewed and became an ARS scientist with a lecturer's appointment in the department. Now just for a little department history here, this is the audience participation part of my talk today. And I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that we don't have a few of the older Ameritai, but we have a few of the long-standing senior members of the department here today. And I'm gonna, we're gonna go try to go through and identify these faculty members from our department. And if we can't get them all, we'll, we'll circulate it in the department. Okay, folks. Shepherd. Shepherd. Uh-huh. Marianne Saul. Yep. Harley. Harley, looking just like Harley. I think this is Bill Hewitt, I'm not sure. What do you guys think? Bob Campbell. Okay, let's do the back row. A much younger. <laughs> Okay, this guy? I couldn't figure that one out. Yeah. Up above? Jim DePay. Oh. This guy? There's George next to him. How about this? Jim Okay, and Nyla? George and Nyla. This is Goheen. There's also How about this? That's I think she made photos. And Kleistowitz? Yeah. And then Joe. 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 And Bob Webster. And then how about this guy? Okay, and then all together, who's this guy? John Mercedes. <laughs> so I was thrilled that he becomes part of this department. It seemed like a green transfer to me. Davis had good schools. I love the weather. I love the uh, the farm country. But there was a little worm in the apple. <laughs> the USDA <coughs> administrator sat me down as soon as I got started and said, you are not going to waste any of your time on virus indexing, holding an import permit for grapevines, foundation plant services. All of that stuff is service work. It's suicide for a young research scientist. Don't do it. So that's, that's good, well and good, except then I go out to lunch with the leadership of the wine and grape industry. And they sit me down and say, you know, we went to Congress and got Goheen's position filled with you so that you could do the indexing whole permit <laughs> and run foundation plan service. There was a little disconnect there. <laughs> How did we resolve that? Well, we resolved it by doing a lot of talking, doing a lot of thinking, doing a lot of lobbying. And the solution that was developed was that the University of California would have a new facility, the Foundation Plant Services facility, the building I showed you at the beginning of my talk, that it would be run by the university. And of course, we already had Dr. T. Rohani, who's been my partner at FPS for many years now, um, doing the pathology out there. But the industry lobbied to get the new building, which we needed very badly. I helped with some of that lobbying. And um, the university would hire a plant pathologist, a faculty level plant pathologist, to handle the administrative side of the foundation plant services. So that position was created and advertised for in 1993. By 1994, fall of 1994, the doors were ready to open, and I was lucky enough to be the successful candidate for that job. So we solved the problem, but then there becomes a vacancy in ARS for the research side. And Jerry Momoto and now Sudi have, have filled that part of the mission for the ARS group ever since. So this is a very important photograph to me. This was the ASCB annual meeting in 1994. This was important for a number of reasons. I had just heard that I had been, was going to be offered the job. The committee had decided that I would be the one of the five candidates who would be hired. So that was very good news. 
It was also a picture of me with my graduate students and with Dr. Rohani and Sue Sim, who's my technician, just before I started the new job. And until this year, I have not had a graduate student since then. The job has simply been too overwhelming. But um, Carrie Arnold came to FPS to work, and when she started graduate school, I was very glad to take her on, especially since Neil's going to do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> So Sue has a master's degree in plant pathology. She came out here to become a technician and completed her master's. And she's been a staff research associate at a high level ever since, which is actually a career path that a number of PhDs out of this program have taken that choose to stay in research but not take a faculty position. All of you know Adib Rohani. He's been the, the core of our lab and our diagnostics at FKS since the late 1980s. And uh, he and I have really worked well together over the years. Raquel Salati was one of our PhD students here, and she's now working at Drisco in the strawberry industry on the private sector side. Fatima Osman went away, worked for the UN for a while, and came back to Davis for a family move, and is now working as a project scientist in the in my lab. Tatiana, last I heard, was working as a postdoc for USDA in Bellsville. I'm not quite sure where she is now, I have to admit. And then the tragedy in all of this is Marissa. She was a brilliant student. She finished her master's degree with me. And she decided that being a plant pathologist wasn't easy enough to move a position. And her husband also had a high level career. So she went to dental school. And I figured anyone who has her as their dentist is pretty darn lucky. But um, we were really sorry to lose her as a plant pathologist because she was a very good scientist as well. There was one other reason this is an important picture to me, is that it was this ASEB annual meeting that Dick Honish and I had our first date. <laughs> <laughs> so in September, I knew you'd like that. <laughs> so in, in, I'm blushing. <laughs> so in September, I started the new job. Um, things don't always go perfectly in administration at the universities. Um, probably this is news to all of you. But I actually got a call from the dean asking me whether um, um, I would be willing to take 100% of an academic administrator title because the 30% that was supposed to be a cooperative extension title, like Mike Davis and Doug Googler, hadn't gone through the committees yet, and she couldn't offer me that until the proper sign-offs had happened. And I said, oh, excuse me. Uh, but no one's offered me the job. She said, oh shit, we'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> so the committee that had, had selected me had given the position to the dean's office. It's a dean's office center that I'm running. And no one there realized that the committee didn't feel empowered to offer me the job. So I was on pins and needles for a little while on that one. But it all worked out. <laughs> so what's Foundation Plant Services? We're a self-supporting center in the college of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, one of the oldest centers in the college. Uh, it goes back to the 1950s when it was cutting edge science to screen horticultural, vegetatively propagated crops for viruses, perform therapy if necessary, and then release wood from virus-free cultivars to the nursery industry so they can make plants for the growers that were more productive because they didn't have damage <coughs> pathogens. So the, the formal mission, we produce, test, maintain, and distribute the leaf disease-tested plant propagation material. We provide plant importation and quarantine services, virus testing, and elimination. We coordinate releases of UC patent and horticultural varieties. Now this is less than 5% of our job in terms of the work that we do, but it's so big as far as campus administration is concerned especially for strawberries, because the strawberry patent royalty income to the system and the campus is so huge. Um, we link researchers, nurseries, and producers, and it makes sense that I have a cooperative extension title as well as this academic administrator title. The cooperative extension title, yes, I have to do some, some I do a little teaching, I do a little research, but the academic administrator title allows me to get credit for doing things that simply are not what a teaching research faculty member can do. So the people who put my position together are quite wise. And I'm not an academic senate member, and most days I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So we have crops, our crops, we can take on new crops. They're usually vegetatively propagated, although we do have a few crops where we're actually distributing seed. Grapevines is the elephant in the zoo. I mean, it's our really big program, more than half of our volume. We have uh, eight acres of roses. I welcome you all, uh, Cinco de Mayo, uh, May 5th, there's going to be our rose collection. We'll be open for Rose Day, and you can walk through all that eight acres of roses and see what's happening there. We have the UC Strawberry Breeders Program. We have a sweet potato program, a fruit tree program, and a pistachio hybrid seed. There's a rootstock in pistachio hybrid, F1 hybrid seed. So this is a quote from me. Foundation Plant Services has a very straightforward business plan. We lose money on every sale, and then we try to make it up in volume. <laughs> We have a store. We distribute seeds and cuttings and plants, five plants. But the cost of producing those plants and those cuttings in a university environment is extremely high. Employee benefits are high. Salaries are high. The cost of maintaining the eight acres of roses or the 100 acres of grapes, which might only be needed by a nursery every 10 or 15 years. So we've got a library and, and an inventory that doesn't turn over all that often. Um, all of those things make it extremely expensive to run our programs. And so we work with industry for, they, they get us funds through assessments, through grants, through user fees, through patent monies, um, and, and lots of other ways to make sure that the programs keep going. And our gross the last few years has been a little over $3 million a year. So my day job is bringing in that $3 million a year so that we can pay our employees. Because we don't have funding from the university except for Dr. Rapani's position and for 60% of my position. We've got about 30 people and it's all self-supporting. So that's what I mostly do. And that's why um, I, I haven't felt like I could be too involved with graduate students because I just have to keep these other uh, areas of the fire. To give you an example, our Rose program has probably got one of the simplest business models. It costs about $85,000 a year to maintain those roses, add new ones, keep this caught up, collect the, safe, collect the cuttings, ship them to, to growers and nurseries and women and so forth. We make about $35,000 selling the cuttings. The other $50,000 comes from the Garden Rose Council, which is a national cooperative uh, effort of big garden rose nurseries, and they cut us a gift check for $50,000 every year. And that's how we keep it going. Here's a little overview of our facility. We're in the process of building a <coughs> new building here, hoping to get rid of this nasty trailer that we've had for almost 20 years. And um, we've got about half the money we need to build a new building. But it'll include a, a classroom, office space, and really upgrade our, our um, space for our staff. We weren't able to afford to add to the lab, but we will be able to take some lab functions that are more office-like and move them into the new building, which will free space up a little bit in the lab. The lab's always just packed as tight as it could be with projects. Now, one of the other things we do is we also have import quarantine permits for grapevines, for strawberries, for olives, and we can and have gotten them for a few other crops. And that's because there's, there's um, terrible diseases like thumbpox virus that came into the United States on illegally smothered, smuggled peaches, or like Pierce's disease, there's nothing better than a plant for planting as a vehicle, as a vector for um, dam possible damage in plant pathogens and, and, and pests. And so um, the rules about horticultural crops like the ones at FPS, the federal rules are really, really strict. And in the case of grapes, it requires at least a two-year quarantine and there's only three permit holders for grapes in the whole United States. And, and FPS UC Davis is where 99% of the grapes imported to the United States have come from corn. So we work closely with the California Department of Food and Agriculture on our grape fruit tree and nut tree and strawberry certification programs. So state regulators oversee FPS at the foundation stage of the material that's in the registration and certification program the viruses, and then they also inspect, they inspect us, and then they inspect the nurseries for people who are in that voluntary program. Grapes, as I said, is our biggest program. Essentially, this is what we do with most of our, our programs. 
We bring in new material. It could be foreign, domestic, or new varieties. We do disease testing. And a lot of the research in our lab um, is around having better testing techniques. And we've made incredible progress in the last 20 years there. If something tests positive, then we do disease elimination. And that's usually tissue culture. But there's some heat treatments that you can use to get rid of disease as well. Once we go back to disease testing and all the tests are negative, then we plant our grapevines as provisional lines in our foundation. Now, a big part of our program is also professional identification of the vines once they're there. And that's, a, that's very much valued by the nurseries. The vines don't become registered in the program until ID, the ID has been verified. And then our vines go to nurseries and growers. And we can sell to actual growers, great growers. And some of the wineries, for instance, get budwood cuttings from us uh, directly. But mostly, our clientele are the big production nurseries, which in California are really interesting. And I think, uh, Bruce, you take, you take your class to see a couple of the, the big production nurseries. It's really fascinating seeing literally millions of trees being budded in the field, or literally millions of great bench grass being made in greenhouses. I encourage you to see as much of that as you can. There's a number of serious debilitating diseases in grapevines, uh, which we screen for. And then when we do importation and quarantine, what we do is we try to collect the most elite stock that's already been screened in Europe that we can, because that'll help us from having to do too much therapy. We collect that stock. It almost always comes over with budwood. And if you have dormant budwood, if you dip it in insecticide and a fungicide, and then make your plants from that, there's no soil, there's no roots, and you really reduce the chance of bringing in any problems. So that's our strategy with the importation. We have a lot of different testing methods, herbaceous host indexing, woody and field indexing, ELISA, reverse transcriptase PCR. Um, you'll, all of you who take the, the plant virology class will do some um, herbaceous host indexing. We do a field index where it's a very laborious index where Chip buds from the candidate vine that's been imported or is coming into the program are grafted to indicators. And this year, we had five acres of indicators that had to be looked at after two years and read for symptoms. And it's a massive job. Maintaining them, keeping them weeded, and then making sure that they're in the best, best condition so that you can actually see the virus symptoms that can be caused in that. And that's the test required by the feds. We do a lot of ELISA testing, but more and more um, ELISA testing is being superseded by the really excellent PCR tests available to us. Don't slide just a little bit. And we've been working very closely with some of the people in the vet med facility. Tima Osman and Adid have been uh, uh, leading this work. Um, to increase our workflow using some of the automated instrumentation that they had over in the vet med uh, center that we didn't have. We've been fortunate enough now to purchase a lot of that instrumentation ourselves. And the um, uh, TabMan PCR is really working well for many of our plant systems. In the old days, heat therapy was used for the grape program. Now it's used largely for the strawberry program. You put the strawberries in heat at 37 degrees centigrade for about a month. It, it, it inhibits viral replication, and then you culture meristems from those plants to produce the plants that go to the nurseries. And what shoot tip culture involves, this is a horticultural technique that's been used since the 1950s. It's been carefully studied, and the most recent literature where probes were used into these tissues, still doesn't quite explain why you get rid of the virus. We used to think it was because there wasn't vascular connections and the virus wasn't in this tissue. But the virus does seem to be in the tissue. Somehow it dies out. We go and take a piece that's 0.5 milliliters or smaller and, and, and put it into <coughs> tissue. It takes about six months to get back a break that size. And you see Sue cutting those mirrors. <coughs> Here we are in the tissue culture chambers. Plants just about ready to go to soil. And then um, another part of our program, as I mentioned, cultivar identity, identity verification, trueness to type. FPS stock today is described as professionally identified true to type. We don't say virus-free, and we don't say true to type. We say virus-tested, 
for specific pathogens and, and professionally identified. And, and the lawyers like it that way. You can only do as well as it's possible to do with the tools you have. Um, we have a contract when people buy our material that basically says that no matter what disease it has or how much we get it mixed up, it's not our fault. And, and <laughs> several of the nurseries, <laughs> several of the nurseries have insisted when their um, clients complain about their contracts, the, the, the growers read my contract because it's it's so very um, clear in that respect. But you can imagine if you get the wrong cultivar of a strawberry to a nursery that takes that meristem and makes two million plants from it, that then go to growers, the growers are going to be suing the nursery and the nursery is going to be suing the university. And Sometimes I wonder that they let us open our doors every day, but so far, so good. <laughs> and, uh, generally, our nurseries have been very understanding. We've made mistakes, and our growers have um, been um, understanding because the nurseries make it right with the growers, and we make it right with the nurseries. But I know a lot more about contract law than I ever expected. <laughs> When it comes to ampelography, in the old days there was this whole mythos around grapes. It still exists actually, called ampelography. And there were beautiful books written in the, in the uh, Middle Ages with pictures of different grape varieties talking about the, the length of shoots and the colors of hairs and the, the conformation of the leaves. An expert like these ones, Anna Schneider from Italy, Andy Walker here from the Davis campus, Jean-Michel Gorsica from, from Montpellier in France, these guys can walk through a collection, and most things they'll tell you what cultivar it is just by walking through. And if they have, if they come across one they're not sure, they really like that, and they start getting out their books and arguing about it. <laughs> Fortunately, in the meantime, DNA technology has developed, and the same kind of technology that lets you send in a sample of your dog's hair and find out what kind of pedigree it has, we have also now applied to grades. Carol Meredith was one of the people who spearheaded this work in the 1990s for grape vines. She retired early to run her winery in Napa County, and her technician, Jerry Dangle, came to work for me. And he and Judy Lepier run our plant identification lab, which is a service lab for DNA cultivar identification of grapes, walnuts, fruit trees, strawberries, and other crops um, that we have set up in the lab. And, and Bud is a really good researcher and has managed to work out fingerprint profiles using amplified markers of many crops. As soon as the need comes up, we get a little extra money, a little mm -hmm. extra help, and within a year we seem to have a database to um, sort the cultivars out. So that's very, very reassuring to me. When I've got 20 key UC strawberries on greenhouse benches, we never see the flowers or fruits, we don't know what they're supposed to look like, and they don't look normal in a greenhouse. Well now, every year they get DNA tested to make sure there aren't any propagation mixes. So this is just an example of this kind of an analysis that we were able to determine that Cabernet Sauvignon was created as a child of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, so we inspect the vineyards, we sell the plants and the plant cuttings. Uh, those are our products, dormant cuttings and pots in, in uh, orange pots with soil. <coughs> We've had the fun of going around California's older vineyards and collecting heritage clones of varieties that probably came over in the 1800s around California, Cabernets and Chardonnays. In grapes, people very much believe that total differences within a cultivar can be important in wine making. So there's quite a bit of clone worship going on in California. We spend time on patents and trademarks, trade secrets and contracts. Um, all those kinds of things are used to create ownership of proprietary plant material in our collection. We've had to work a lot internationally. The French have a Anta Inra trademark patent, um, trademark um, protection for their uh, clone material, which they market in California to nurseries which have licenses. And they are one of our biggest customers because their collection is with us. And they tell us who can get it because they pay all the bills on that material. Globalization has been interesting. Programs like ours are increasingly financially endangered. There really isn't a place to pay for an ex experiment station system. And there's very few states like California with a nursery industry that thinks so far ahead and is able to 
to fund something like the programs we hear at have at FPS. So we're actually serving as a great clean plant program for, for Israel, for South Africa, for New Zealand and Australia to some extent. We hear from people all over the world. That can be a real drag on our business model because most of those customers are very time consuming in terms of their biosanitary needs and their uh, the complications of linguistics. More and more, we're trying to come up with common standards for nursery stock around the world, and it's the International Plant Protection Convention of, of the FAO that actually looks at those issues, and I'm involved in committee work with the folks in the IPPC. Now, I've got another quote. This one's from my Aunt Phyllis, who's a very successful artist. She's worked in, she did her MBA at Berkeley, and she's worked in, in uh, precious metals, she's worked as a jeweler, she's a painter, she's taught successfully. And she says this about art. She says, every artist has a sense of scale. The biggest challenge is finding the scale that will allow you to do your very best work. I think that's true for scientists, too, very much so. I think there's people whose mind works around the image of a protein molecule fully. I think there's people that work at the cellular level, people that work at the whole plant level, people that work at the level of a complex ecology with multiple organisms. I, as a PhD student, worked with insect vector plant pathogens, which meant I had to keep the plants going, I had to keep the bugs going, and I had to keep the pathogens going, and then you had to bring them all together. It was kind of like building a house of cards to do an experiment, because all those pieces had to be there. Um, what I've found is later in my career, in the position that I'm in, I've had an opportunity to do things that I really love doing that I never would have imagined doing with a PhD in plant pathology. But they're things that are the sense of scale that I find the most satisfying. And those tend to be organizational things. And I just wanted to briefly get a chance to tell you about a few of them. Obviously, Foundation Plant Services, we do a lot of outreach. outreach. We do a lot of writing. We do a lot of explaining to people. And that's been really fun. We try to make sure that all our staff really can be there when people call, which is hard for other parts of the university to do. But we do really great newsletters and a lot of other stuff. I've also gotten involved in helping to manage some grant programs for our vice president's office. Probably you know our vice president is the level at which the UC experiment station is placed in the University of California system. And we have experiment station campuses at Berkeley, at Riverside, at Davis, and then we have county scientists like our farm advisors, and many of our graduates do go into farm advisor positions um, that are also UC faculty in the counties. So um, for the vice president's office, I created a website for some federal and state money, partnered with the American Vineyard Foundation, and we were basically able to do away with paper grant submissions. And we were also able to make the format the same for a whole bunch of grape and uh, uh, commodity grants. So when I started, you had to have a separate format, a separate proposal, and a separate report for the Table Grape Commission, the Raisin Board, and the American Vineyard Foundation. Now it's all unified on one website. PIs can submit there. The reviewers can look at them there. The commodity groups can make their agency decisions. And Vicki Clausen on my staff, who is an SRA who got her PhD with Bryce Falk, and I manage that system and help those agencies with the process. Now we've lost the federal and state money in the last couple of years because of the situation in Congress, but we're still keeping the website going and we partnered this year with the Pierce's Disease um, and Glassing and Sharpshooter Board, which is an industry assessment out of CDFA, and they are now using that website to again try and facilitate cooperation to get money to researchers. I really enjoyed that part of my work. I set up a website called the UC Integrated Viticulture Online. I found that the ANR, the Vice President for Agricultural and Natural Resources, uh, programming guys who I met on the grant sites are just wonderful to work with. And we've set up a really information dense website here. And right here, we have actually an encyclopedia of all the stuff that UC researchers have done in viticulture and enology, posted as much as possible. And I was allowed, doesn't sound so uh, awe-inspiring right now, but this was six or seven years ago. It was a really big deal that the UC people let me put everything under the Regents' trademark up there, including whole books that they were still selling as hard copies. So that's worked out really well, and I think we've videotaped a lot of seminars and events for the grape and wine industry, including the research conference we run. 
And I love doing that kind of stuff because it lets people know what we're doing here on campus, how important our research is, and that we are still there, which sometimes our industry forgets. Uh, another project that I'm really enjoying is I'm working with the staff of California Agriculture to raise money for the Hildardia project. You, sh you should all have seen references to Hildardia in li your literature searches. It was the publication of the University of California for many years in the agricultural sci uh, sciences. And the monographs they published were published in a different time where someone like Ira Condit had time to do a 247-page uh, monograph on the fig that is still the text on figs, fig varieties, and fig biology. And it was like a, a, the production of you know, 20 years of his career. The culmination was these monographs. Well, Hilgardia is now dark literature. Now, that sounds like it might be naughty or something. Um, <laughs> what dark literature is, is dark literature is literature that is not up on the web and can't be accessed online. And we're losing access to a lot of this literature. And we can't be confident that the paper copies will be maintained where we can get hold of them. So I've started fundraising with the in industry. And we've already raised over $21,000. We need a little over $30,000. But we actually got a spare set of Hilgardia from the Davis Library. I worked there with Axel Board, the Agriculture Special Collections guy. He had a four-bound set of Hilgardia. And we have taken that set, and we've shipped it to India. And they're tearing it apart, scanning it, and they'll bring it back, and it will go up online on the California Agriculture website. And it, 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 they, they do things with computer programming to make sure it's all cross-referenced and searchable at a high level on things like Google. And I don't understand that stuff. It, 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 it works beautifully. And just if you want to experiment with that, the California Agriculture magazine back into the 19th 15s is all up online there. And you, you go in and you not only see the article, but all the references in the articles are linked to copies of the references. It's, it's very information dense and very well done. And they'll do, they'll do a great job on the Silver Guardian project, which I'm really jazzed about. I, I conceived and uh, managed the National Grapevine Registry with Nancy Sweet, who's a really wonderful scientist on my staff. Basically, this is a registry of all the grapes in the United States. How does someone know if they need to import a grape if they don't know whether it's here or not? And what are they going to call the grape? How are they going to know they have the right synonym when there's so many different names for the same grapes, especially in Europe? So we've created a database. It has all the commercial nurseries on it. You can look up the nursery by their state. You can sort for a particular state. It has all the varieties. There's a fuzzy logic search engine here where you can put in a synonym and it'll tell you whether that grape is in the United States by any particular synonym. We have done research on the synonyms and we tell you what references we use. And then the, all the nurseries have a back door to this website where they can tell you when you go to that nursery whether they have a particular variety or even a particular clone because you can view a clone list of varieties that have multiple clones which have at least theoretically different performance characteristics for wine making. And then on top of that, Sue on my lab is very artistic. She does a lot of art um, work in a small business she has in, on the side at home. She makes greeting cards and all kinds of uh, books and things like that. She's really talented. So uh, we really needed pictures of all of these grapes. And about two years ago, I said, Sue, you know, I'll get you a really good camera. And I want you to go out and start doing photographs for our website. And that's working out beautifully. We've got over 700 cultivars of grapes in our collection and over 3,000 clones. But we want to have pictures. People want to see pictures. And with the help of the ANR programmers, we've got really nice little photos now that you can, can uh, clip through all the photos we have of a given variety and clone. And then finally, the National Clean Plant Network is something that I'm very proud of being involved in the creation of. Um, I don't know how big or how small my involvement, involvement was. But as I've told you, in the experiment stations around the country, money for programs like this where we're doing service work. Now, the university mission is teaching, research, and service. And I will argue in every room I get a chance that service is much underrated in terms of its importance. And there is service that is very important technically difficult and needs to be delivered for the common good. It isn't research or teaching. The fact that you should get more credit for those efforts. The 
the program that's the closest to FPS is the Crosser through the great program. And they were going to close their door because off the top USDA funding that kept them going since the 1950s was being taken away by the directors of the experiment station who needed the money for the research and teaching mission. And I understand why it happened, but we were very concerned. And so we started to have meetings talking about how we could get a business plan for national clean plant programs. And what we did quite a bit of lobbying, and so did the fruit tree and grape industry. And in the 2008 Farm Bill, there was a national clean plant network created in section 1020, 10202 for pathogen and diagnosis and elimination, existing federal and state clean plant centers. They didn't want everybody in the world deciding they wanted to jump into the business. Um, to consult the state departments of agriculture and universities, and there was $20 million. And because that farm bill was late, the amount available for grants was $5 million for each of four years. And we just got the request for proposals for the last chunk of that money today. But FPS has been one of the centers that has been fortunate enough to receive some really good funding, and it's let us really do some things that are really important. So our NCPN mission provide high quality, asexually propagated plant material free of targeted plant pathogens and pests that cause economic loss. And um, that's pretty much what we do. Um, we have a national governing board. We have special crop networks for our crops. We have industry, university extension, and regulatory people involved. I'm the chair of the Grape Network. <laughs> um, the citrus people from Riverside are involved. We have a hop and fruit tree centers, and we recently added berries to the crops that we work on. And these are where the centers are, Corvallis, Prosser, Davis, Riverside, a little citrus work in um, Arizona and uh, Louisiana. There's a program at Cornell for grapes, Missouri has grapes, and so forth, across the country. And it's been fascinating and very interesting for me. We get some funding for our tree program, as well as quite a bit of funding for our grape program. So one of the things we got to do is we were assigned 100 acres at Russell Ranch, which is just down Highway 128, where that nice old Victorian is before you get to Three Palms and everything. And we've been given money to create a state of the world new great foundation. Everything in there will have been through microchip tooth therapy, and it will be a negative for a long panel of PCR, by PCR of um, tests that Dr. Rohani and his scientists have put together. We're going to try and eliminate the pest for stem pitting, which is a mild virus. I'm not sure it can be done, but we're going to give it a shot. And everything will go through agrobacterium vitis testing, because in cold climates, agrobacterium vitis, which unfortunately is widespread in great nursery stock in California, um, can cause really serious problems. It's not a big pathogen in California. And the California nurseries haven't paid much attention in the past, but we get a lot of complaints from New York, from Washington, etc. So we're going to try and take care of that, too. And this is it. We've got an old barn. We've got the plants in the ground. We dug a, a well. We've got a pressurized storage tank. It's really exciting to be doing something really state of the art and, and really new on this land, which uh, people all over the country are excited about. So we don't know if it'll continue in CPN funding for 2013. It would be nice if it did. And we're all involved in trying to make sure that USDA and Congress understand how important having that plant material is in terms of sustainability of these specialty horticultural crops. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.